in the middle of your night, there's a Christian nightlight beaming the good news from 1,149 feet in the air, piercing the darkness with a bright ray of hope. From the tallest freestanding observation tower in the United States, breaking the bondage of temptation by booming down into Sin City's late night Las Vegas strip. Broadcasting live, coast to coast, and streaming around the world on the internet. He's prayed with thousands, and now he's ready to pray with you, the dynamic prayer of faith on the all-new Pray America Live. Here, Midnight's radio pastor, David Wood. Hello, everybody. This is Evangelist David Woods, and I'm with you here maybe for the next hour, two hours, possibly three. Oh, my goodness. Facebook, I could be here all night with you if I have the stamina, if I have the strength. I love being here with you. And I got I got to laughing today. I thought of last night's program. And I'm just, it's so wonderful to be able to talk with you interactively, especially on Facebook. So if you're watching by, or if you're listening by radio or watching by television, uh, the greatest thing is to be able to join me on the same program every Monday through Friday on Facebook or YouTube. And people talk back and forth to me. And while I'm doing this radio broadcast, I'm not only thinking about you, not only controlling the board, not only controlling the switcher, but I'm glancing at people's comments live in real time to see what they have to say. And so I just, I got tickled about it last night. I thought, what a day and an hour we live in where we can actually talk back and forth. And there's, it's like the spirit realm. There's no distance, time or space in the realm of the spirit. It's just, we're just right here together. So join me on Facebook, will you? Tonight's going to be a great night. A woman tried many physicians, remember the story, yet grew worse, so to Jesus she came, and when the crowd tried their best to restrain her, she whispered, words through her pain touching Jesus is all that really matters oh yeah <laughs> your life will never be the same There's only one way to touch him. Just believe. Believe when you call on his name. Do you know the song? Help me sing it. I was bound when I knelt at the old altar. But they said Jesus would meet my every need and he did too when this prisoner deep down I was a prisoner inside finally touched Jesus he set me free oh praise the Lord free indeed I sing this today touching Jesus is all that really matters <laughs> then your life will never be the same there is only one way to touch him just 
believe when you call on that name. Touching Jesus is all that really matters. You know it's the truth. Then your life will never be the same. There's only one way, one way, touch him through believing. Just believe when you call on his name. Just believe. Just believe when you call on his name. I was singing that today. I was singing that with you in mind as I was praying. And I said, Father, help all my partners that are in need today. Help them to just reach out by faith and touch Jesus. I love those words. And that's an old song. It's not surprising to hear me sing an old song or I should say try to sing an old song. Touching Jesus, Father, I pray that everybody that enters the room on Facebook, everybody that comes aboard on YouTube or Periscope, those that are listening by radio or watching by television, wherever they're getting this program from right now, live right now or again on a rebroadcast, May we touch Jesus like the widow reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Touching Jesus is all that matters. Everything's got to be done in faith, you know. Otherwise, you haven't got to the core of the issue. The key issue is your faith. The key issue is your faith. Today, it may be surprising to you. I want to talk to you about things that are better than money. I know a lot of church people don't even use the M word, money, in church. Try it sometime. Say the word money in church and watch everybody break out into a sweat, go into a panic attack, starting with the local pastor. And there are things that are more important than money. When I'm finished, I'll show you where the Bible says money answers all things. Now, money can't save you. Money can't heal you. You can't acquire the anointing that destroys the yokes of bondages or removes burdens. You can't, can't do that. There are things that are better than money. And I want to go through those tonight. I want to minister to you. Some of you are facing some real hard situations. Yolanda, we're going to pray for your son who's incar incarcerated. And you can, um, you can write me your prayer requests, prayer needs right here on Facebook, or you can send them in my email. Email will roll around in a minute. Good to see you, Anna. Good to see you, Terry from Michigan. Good to see you, Brenda. Joanne from Lexington. Bobby from Atlanta. Eric and your precious wife from, from Indiana. Robin, good to see you, brother. Touching Jesus. It's all that really matters. I love him. Can you just can you just tell him how much you love him? Right there where you are, just just tell him how much you love him. Just just brag on him. You've been bringing him your pain all day. Just tell him how much you love him. Just tell him how grateful you are that he's in your life. Thank you, Lord. I don't have a thing that didn't come from you and I bless you tonight. 
I thank you, Father, that we reach out and touch the Lord. We reach out and touch Jesus. And we know that you're right here in this room. You're right here just as close as the mention of the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father, we'll find character, we'll find integrity, we'll find deep meaning in the Word of God. Did you get a pen or a paper? Some kind of device to write some things down? Things that are better than money. Oh, yeah. The book of Acts, the Bible tells us that money perishes with thee. You go out, so does your money. Shows us a great connection, doesn't it? That's right. For years, I dedicated my life to teaching and preaching. And I realized, I began to learn over time that the body of Christ, the church in general, is tremendously bound in the area of stewardship and biblical economics. I've heard a lot of people criticize preachers and most of those people didn't understand what they were talking about when they criticized a preacher. Be very careful, the preacher, the man of God you criticize, you might be putting your life in jeopardy. And there have been times, not often, but there have been times where people said, I've overemphasized the importance of money. But, you know, it's interesting that the preacher of salvation never overemphasized, that he's never accused for overemphasizing salvation. And they never say that the prophet is never criticized for overemphasizing prophecy or the second coming of the Lord. And people, when they stop to think things through, they understand what I'm saying and how I'm setting the captive free in the area of their finances. God is my boss. God the Father, that is. He assigned me to the tremendous task of setting the captives free, and that includes in the area of biblical economics in your life. And, you know, since that subject is primarily dealing with what the Bible says about it, it only stands to reason that, that I've got much to say about that subject. And just like when I'm, when I'm doing an outdoor crusade or an evangelistic service, primarily explaining that Jesus saves, it would be impossible for me to fulfill the wholeness of my anointing, for me to teach biblical economics without mentioning your money. And that's part of the call on my life. Now, you gotta understand something here. Please get, the, get a hold of this. He was called Lucifer. He was stripped of that title. When he fell to um, from heaven to earth, the Bible tells us, he was now demoted not only in his position, but also in his name. Now he's called Satan. All the time that he was here on the earth. But when Jesus bled and died and rose again on the cross, everything shifted again and another demotion took place. And he went not only from Lucifer to Satan, but now he's just the devil. And so I remember I was in a gospel concert with a lot of wonderful people and you know, a lot of the gospel songs, they sing stuff that aren't really biblical accurately, but, 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 they're, but they're emotionally exciting. And a lot of that's changed over the years. But this one powerful singer got up and she's passed now. And she hollered out, talking to Lucifer. And the light went on in me. 
said, Lucifer's no longer Lucifer. That was his God-given name. And when I studied that word, I found out that the Lu and Lucifer is the same Lu and hallelujah. His job title was to shine light on God constantly. And the last part of Yah is Yahweh. So hallelujah. And when the devil encountered Jesus after the cross, the Bible says, and I've had demons scream out and say so, confirming what the Bible says, that he made a show of them. One demon screamed out, I'll never forget, said we were there when he was stripped in front of all the other demons. Stripped naked. That's only experience. And I got, I, I, I guess I have enough of the Bible to, to back it up. He made a show of him openly. And he stripped him not only of his clothing, of his authority, of his nature. I mean, Jesus really did a number. And he stripped him of his, even his name. I don't even, I don't even refer to him as Satan. I don't even refer to him as Lucifer. Surely not. There was three archangels. There was Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. And Lucifer was by far the most beautiful, created that way, and his job was to constantly give worship and praise to the Lord. But now he's just the devil. All oh, these poor young people running around today, they have no idea. Hollywood is fed them a bunch of lies and told them that painted a, a mental image that the devil isn't a sexy muscular being with a pitchfork and a tail and horns and in a red skin tight suit. I had a girl tell me that in California one time after service. That's what her picture was. I said, that's not the devil. That's Hollywood's image. Little goatee, you know. That's not his image. He's less than. He's less than. When I blow my nose, he's less than that. When I cough it up, he's less than that. And he's underneath your feet. I said he should be underneath your feet. But ignorance in the body of Christ is extremely expensive. Ignorance with my children is expensive. Ignorance with volunteers is expensive. Anytime somebody learns, it will cost somebody else. Your learning is costing somebody. When you go to the university, your learning is costing somebody. You do a job for the ministry and you learn along the way, it costs somebody. I'm learning how to set a page out on the computer. It's costing. I never wasted more paper than I have on all my life. I thought they asked me, they called me back. They said, how's it going? I said, I've never wasted so much paper on all my life. They said, that's part of it. It's hard for me to swallow that, but I guess it is. This, what I'm about to tell you might shock you, but the devil is a Bible student. There is a absolute reason for opposition to the message of prosperity in the body of Christ. And no, nobody's criticized me. Nobody's said anything. I mean, if they do, they say it behind my back. They say it where I can't hear it. But I just hear from the Lord and I just say what the Lord wants me to say. But you got to realize that the devil knows that a rich church, a rich church would be much more believable to a lost and dying world than a poor church. You do know that, don't you? Certainly you, you can grab a hold of that. I want you to make note that this is not just an opinion of mine. I've got Bible to back it up and substantiate what I'm saying. The passage of scripture I'm about to share with you thoroughly backs up what I just said. Except as strange as it may be, 
many, or I should say most Christians don't even know it's there. And the Bible verse that I'm talking about is, if, uh, excuse me, Ecclesiastes 9. You can look it up yourself and you probably should mark it before you ever say anything like this to somebody else in the church. You should mark it because they will take you to the slaughterhouse over this if you don't have the Bible to back it up. And they should. If you don't have Bible to back something up, take it to the woodshed. Ecclesiastes 9 says, This wisdom have I seen and also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little cry, a little city, and a few men within it. There came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, this is King Solomon talking, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. You may come on here with cut off blue jeans and a tank top and a, and a hat and a tennis racket in my hands and looking like a slob. My words would not be heard, nor would they be remembered. And I think every minister, especially young ministers, need to understand that if you want to be heard, if you want to be remembered, do things in excellence. Go for it and do it right. He says, by my preacher, he come up in flip flops and shorts and good for him. Let's see how many people remember who he, I don't, I can't remember their name. They told me that and I can't even, I don't know who they are. He said, you looking on the outward appearance. Yeah, that's right. Cause I got two eyeballs in my head. I'm a fleshly man. And the Bible says God looks on the heart. Man will always look on the outward appearance. I remember going to a church one time and the anointing was so heavy and so powerful. I'd been praying and seeking the Lord and I got up and, and I mean, I, I looked like God's choice servant. You understand? Everything was perfectly in place. Everything. And I started seeing the reactions on people's face and they didn't like it. They did not like excellence. You're going to find that. You'll find a lot of people that despise excellence. It's the lazy way out. And I had to tell him, I said, don't judge me because of what I look like. Judge me based on the anointing in my life. Now, that scripture there that I, that I said, Yes, we are Christ's representatives in the earth. We are God's ambassador. That scripture boldly declares that no one listens to poor people. And I'm convinced that when, when the devil saw these verses, the devil immediately launched an all-out effort campaign to bring the doctrine of insufficiency to the church. Why wouldn't he? Pretty clever. The devil knew if men taught God's word of abundance without opposition, prosperity would quickly come to God's children. And guess what would happen? Oh, yeah. We'd have won the world by now. The church would be able to fund massive world evangelism. We'd be able to feed babies in the streets of India. We'd be able to We'd be able to do so much. We would have already arrived. If that would have happened, everyone in the world would hear a, a clear witness of the gospel. And multitudes upon multitudes would have already been saved. And as soon as, 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 soon as he learned that no one listens to poor people like King Solomon discovered. The 
devil began to replace the truth of God's abundant supply with religion and tradition, with the words of just barely getting by, brother, just, just, just holding on. And it's cost the church. Ignorance is expensive. Let me say, where did he get that scripture? Let me give it to you again. Ecclesiastes 9, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Go look at it for yourself. Read it in the King James if you'd like. But it's clear that the church has paid absolutely no attention to that verse. The very few people listens to poor people. Why? Well, it's as if the Bible had never even brought these words forth. Instead, just the opposite is true. There's a church-wide acceptance of the erroneous virtues of shortage and insufficiency. In fact, it goes beyond just, you know, accepting the, the message of insufficiency and poverty. There is an organized effort, an organized opposition to biblical economics. There's an organized efforts against abundance and prosperity, and it seems impossible, but the blindness goes even deeper. The church has actually formed special elite, ecclesiastical, denominational, religious orders of priests, preachers, and bishops who have taken firm vows of poverty. They sincerely at a gut level believe that taking an unscriptural position will make them and their message more believable. Oh, church. Oh, listen, child of God. When, when we wake up from this delusion that the devil has blinded the eyes of so many, everything in the world will change. Solomon didn't say everyone listens to a poor man's wisdom. He clearly said the poor man's wisdom is not heard. Ecclesiastes 9, 16. Well, you don't, do you listen to poor people on TV and take their word and launch out? Very rarely, very rarely, if ever. The world knows that the church is trying to figure it out. And God is the one who makes you rich. And there are things, with this thought in mind, still there are things better than money. I find out that the, over time that the people that are the most critical over a prosperity preacher are in love with their money. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue, H-E-A-R-T, heart. Well, <laughs> to give you a small idea of how firmly entrenched the erroneous doctrine of insufficiency is flowing through the church. You should know that I've been teaching biblical economics and teaching people how to break the bondages of poverty off their life for, well, I've been in ministry 40 years, so at least half that, 20 years. And God has given me breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough, and especially in the area of revelation, like the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. I had one man, he, he was sort of a figment of his, of his own imagination. He thought he was something and nobody ever heard of him. And, and he sat there right to my face and said, you need to come down a little bit. Well, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. What do you mean, come down? Are you kidding me? He didn't just say that. And Angela looked at me and I looked at Angela and I quickly learned I was with the wrong group of people. He's called you to seat, be seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's called you to come up out of that valley. And when I explored a little deeper, I found out 
broke, busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted. And a sizable part of the church is, is now coming out of the bondages that have held the church captive for so long. A great, great, great amount of the church folks are coming out of that trashy doctrine that the devil started many years ago. But when it comes to the message of abundance, I mean real abundance. I mean sufficiency to the point that you would have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Second Peter 1, 3. He wants to give you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Oh yeah, uh, Psalms 34, 10. That you would want for absolutely nothing. But sad to say, I don't mean to be a bearer of bad news, but this is true. Sad to say that every everyone except the strongest believer in the message of faith draws back. I find myself tempted to draw back. It was a real big thing with me. When I was, when even the, even the salesman, bless his heart, you don't need that. This'll do. You don't need that machine. This, this one will do. And I kept hearing the Lord say, you're going to listen to him. You're going to listen to me. I said, Lord, I always listen to you. But I said, it's about $2,500. He said, I've already got it on the way. Ugh. It's a step up that maybe I don't even know if I'll go to the place of having to use all the bells and whistles on there. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, I want you to, I want you to not draw back in your faith. I want you to step forward and, and, and move forward. And we did, and the Lord did, and the rest is history on our printing press. Instead of the church using Ecclesiastes 9.16 on the devil, the devil is using it on the church. I said the other day, and I don't mean to be critical, I don't mean to sound bitter or cynical, and uh, but I want to get truth here. It's shocking to me. I can walk into a building, a church building, that generation after generation has bought and paid for it. Its value is two, three million dollars. And they stick a guy on a board, make him a signer on the account, who's in a little 800 square foot apartment and can't meet the rent. Those go, that flies in the face of the, it goes contrary to the teachings of Christ. If you go through the book of Luke, you're going to find out Jesus very, very clearly played, laid out stewardship behavior. To one who has much, I'll give more. To one who has no, I'll, I'll take it away. Stewardship behavior, shocking. But there is a power, and I see, we've seen this with COVID. With the COVID-19, we saw this. And we continue to see it. Entire warfare of countries use what we call the power of misinformation. There is a powerful weapon without firing a shot, without blowing up anything, it's called misinformation. Every successful army throughout history has leaked it out. And the devil, the devil is using the powerful weapon on the church of our day. And it's causing destruction in the lives of many of God's children. And there's a specific verse of scripture that can explain the mess that we're in as a church, as a whole. And it really comes as a warning, a word of warning from God. And perhaps you even know it or have it memorized. It's in Hosea chapter four, verse six. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The misinformation that the devil puts out about scripture thrives where people have a lack of knowledge of the word of God. But they don't know how to get in the word, how to study to show themselves approved a good workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That misinformation the devil puts out is just boiling over in those churches. 
and you've been in some of those churches and some of you have walked in and turned right around and walked out. Well, why is it that the traditions of men prevail? The main reason unscriptural traditions about poverty remain in the church world is that the children of God don't study their Bibles enough to recognize misinformation when they hear it. If we would only do what the scripture, scriptures teach us and study to show ourselves approved, the church of our day would not be standing before a dying world at the end time totally empty handed. I'll never forget, I was in a meeting, 1987 I believe it was, with Dr. Floyd Lahan at the upper room in Westminster, California. And his special guest was a young preacher from Tennessee who would buck and shout and spit past the third row, Perry Stone. A lot's changed since then. But I remember he made a comment that was very powerful. He said, oh to God, that at the turn of the century, 1900s, Christian men would have seen it and seized the opportunities and bought all the newspapers of the 1900s during the roaring 20s and the crashed economy, the Great Depression. He said the church world missed a beautiful opportunity that we would be living in victory in right now. We wouldn't have this phony baloney news media lying snakes saying the things that they say. We got to get back to the study of the word of God. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself a good uh, approved unto God. Oh, good workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't despair. Beloved, victory is on the horizon. I said victory is on the horizon. The Bible clearly tells us that men's traditions is now at hand. And Simon Peter prophesied that the restoration would come just before our Lord Jesus returns. And I want you to hear the bold promise he made to those of us who have the privilege of, of living right here on the tail end of, of time here on earth as we know it. Acts 3, 19, 20, and 21. Listen to the bold proclamation as Simon Peter prophesies it. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What a wonderful promise. Oh no, what a powerful promise that is. And the apostle says restoration is coming to the whole church in the last days. And here we are in the last days in the church world. We are the church. It's coming. And here's the best part. The promise is for you. The promise is for me. For we are those saints who live in the last days of time. And let me tell you, there are some things that are better than money. And the Bible is without a doubt the most complete book in existence, 66 chapters. It deals with marriage, rearing children, honesty, rebellion, prophecy, salvation, heaven and hell, uh, as well as many other subjects. Uh, and if you'll closely observe it, it becomes very obvious that the Bible deals primarily with practical things. And the reason it has much to say about money is that financial matters are practical matters. But let me quickly add something even more significant. Nowhere does scripture ever say that money is the most important thing. 
Nowhere does the Bible say that money is the most important thing. Now, we're on a campaign, and we're going to raise a million dollars, and we're already, <laughs> what do we do? We needed a thousand people sewing a thousand dollars, and we're down to where's my notes? Got so excited in here last night, it blew everything away. Nine hundred and sixty-five, something like that. We we'll have to update those records. I'm gonna put it on the screen next week. But let me tell you, the things that are more important than money, and I, I hope I can get through this quickly. I want to pray for some folks tonight. And I'll just quickly go through them as quick as I can. The first thing I would say is your good name. Job 1, verse 1, and remember we have to be careful with what Job says because a lot of what Job says, even though it's true he said it, what he says is not necessarily truth in a lot of passages. Job 1, verse 1 says, the man was perfect and upright. And if you were to, if you were to ask a group of people to write down 10 of the most valuable things they own. Few would ever put on that list a good name. But the word of God tells us that a good name is one of the most valuable things a person can have. The devil, listen to me, young preacher. Listen to me, young man. Listen to me, young lady. The devil is out to ruin your name. He tried with me in the 90s. And he lost all oh, those poor little saps that had to believe the devil's words and not truth. Help them, Jesus. We pray for them. Little lost, precious saints. They just fly by the seat of their pants and just get flown around with every rumor. You've had said things said about you. But a good name is the most valuable thing a person can have. And the devil will do his best to try to ruin your name. This is why it's important you don't travel alone. This is why it's important you have a group of people around you that you answer to. I see preachers all the time. They flying all here and flying there. And I, want, I kind of scratch my head. Where's their wife? You don't go out and do meetings and preach and go on the mission field by yourself. Is something wrong with you? You setting yourself up for a failure with a big capital F. I don't leave my wife's side. She doesn't leave my wife, my side. We're together in this thing. And she's, she's got my back and I've got her back. And that's why God gives you a wife is so that success can come to you. I'll get to that in the middle and a little bit later because it's one of the things more important than money is a good wife. If you don't have a good wife, you won't have a good name. Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And a lot of people have gotten a lot of riches, but they did not obtain a good name. I pray that my name is a good name. And there are going to be people in the ministry that are going to accuse you falsely. False accusations, the last step towards supernatural promotion. There's going to be people that will slander you. I will never forget the story I heard from Kenneth, I think it was Kenneth Hagan. And how, I, th I believe it was him, he pastored the first church in Texas somewhere. North Texas. Maybe it was Oklahoma. I don't remember. Since it's not my testimony, I probably shouldn't tell it, but he's gone on now and such a, it just, it just left a mark in my mind. He said that he was on his way to the church to counsel a couple in the fifties. I think it was the fifties way back years ago, maybe even before the fifties. And um, his wife stayed home doing dishes, a little housework around the house. And, and the husband and wife came together and they crying and bawling and make up this big story, marriage counseling. 
And she said at the end, she said, Preacher, can I just take a picture with you while we're done here? I want to take my picture with you. And uh, made a big deal of that. Well, he went on praying with them and counseling them. But during that time of counseling session, before the picture could be taken, the Holy Spirit spoke to Kenneth Hagin's wife and said, or maybe it was Kenneth Hagin's pastor. That's what it was. Excuse me. Kenneth Hagin was telling the story of his pastor in the 50s or 40s or maybe earlier than that. His wife heard the Holy Spirit while she was doing dishes and said, drop everything and run to the church to be with your husband. And when she walked into the room, everything seemed to be fine, but something was irritating her spirit. And the couple felt frust- flustered and frazzled and quickly dismissed themselves and said goodbye. And it was learned. The reason they wanted to, to take a picture was the last two churches they'd done this to. She would get over there, cozy up to the pastor, put her arm around his neck, and I guess hurry up, kiss him, put lipstick on his face, and then rip her blouse open, and the husband take a picture, and they would blackmail the pastor. And it happened to two churches prior to them. This is way back in the 50s. But it never happened to Kenneth Hagin's pastor because the wife heard the Holy Spirit, and she ran and, and protected her husband. I think I got that story right. It's very, it just sat with me. The devil's after your name. And he'll have a real easy time. He said, is it hard for you to travel the country with your husband? Well, what do you think? Of course. We knew one preacher in Oklahoma City. Pulled my wife aside and told her how stupid she was. Is something wrong with you? Something, are you dumb? Something wrong with, I mean, just railed on her. Taking these children, going all over the country with your husband. Put her in tears. Don't you want to be in a nice home like us? Well, we didn't tell her we were in a nice home. We just give it up to go out for the Lord. Don't tell everything you know to pea brains. They'll throw you in the pit. And, uh, (laughs) <laughs> what was it a year later we got the report after she so criticized my wife for traveling with me and protecting me on the road that a tornado came through and ripped her whole house off the foundation and she lost it all don't play with God's people better be careful what you say with your mouth towards anointed men and women of God. You better be careful. A good name. And I noticed when the devil tried to go after my name, he went after key influential people. Some still believe the lie today. And Didn't you confront him? I have no reason to try to defend myself. I just hide myself in Christ. Now, you're going to, if you're doing something for God, the devil's going to accuse you. He's a false accuser. He stands before the throne all the time, all the time, making an accusation against you. That's what he does. So I would say if I could start ministry over again, I would, I would do my very best biggest effort to protect my name even if I was young even if I was a nobody even if I wasn't known people talk and there's no better gossiper than a Christian gossiper you know it's true King Solomon was so impressed with the benefit of having a good name He declared it to be more valuable than monetary goods could ever measure up to. And if you look at it very closely, you'll even be more impressed with the importance Solomon placed on a good name. He made another statement about its value in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 1. 
A good name is better than precious ointment. We would say today, um, cologne, perfume. You ever paid $100 for a bottle of perfume? Many of you have. There's a cologne for men that's out on the market right now. It's $800. About that big. Very costly. Do I have it? No. Don't care to have it. <laughs> My daughters are clever. They went to the store. I don't know where it was. Some store that's not in the Pacific Northwest. Maybe down in Miami or somewhere. And without me knowing, and they got a, a free sample. Both of them. <laughs> Who was it? I don't know. Julie or Hannah said, Dad, the, the samples have got to be worth 100 bucks. <laughs> and it wasn't better than anything else but the point is is that a good name is better to be chosen than the most expensive cologne or perfume on the market and the day of death than the day of one's birth a good let's read that again Ecclesiastes 7 1 a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth we cry when people die. You're supposed to cry when they're born. I've had five children. I know about that. No, I'm just teasing. I love every one of them. You love them. You love them. They're yours. They're special to you. But we're supposed to rejoice at graduation day. Solomon says that a good name has a better effect on a man's dignity during his lifetime than the effect embalming ointment has on the body after a person dies. That's, what, that's the point he's trying to get across. Are you getting this tonight? In other words, Solomon says that a good name preserves a man better than life-preserving embalming oils at death time. That's, that's the point. The book of Psalms powerfully describes the benefits of having a good name. And while the words good name do not actually appear, the following verse that I'm going to share with you tonight is clearly a description of a man who has a good name. I know people, they've got lots of money and they've got a terrible name. They've got absolutely zero character. They would steal from your grandmother if they had the chance. Lots of money but they have a horrible name. Psalms 15 verse one in the living Bible says, Lord, who may go and find refuge and shelter in your tabernacle up on your holy hill? The question. And in so many words, the psalmist is asking what kind of person God is going to allow in heaven. A good name. Well, what kind of good names are gonna be in heaven? Well, in the next few verses, Psalms 15, verse 2, 3, 4, and 5, you read on down there, you'll see God gives a powerful answer. And I, and I want you to notice his answer is totally different from the answer of lots of religious leaders out there today. God describes the man he will allow to spend eternity in heaven as one of integrity and honor and a person with a good name. Read it with me. Psalms 15, 2, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Anyone who leads a blameless life and is truly sincere, anyone who refuses to slander others, does not listen to gossip, never harms his neighbor, speaks out against sin, criticizes those committing it, commends the faithful followers of the Lord, keeps a promise even if it ruins him, does not crush his debtors with high interest rates and refuses to testify against the innocent despite the bribes offered him, such a man shall stand firm forever. That is a list. We're talking about entering heaven. Who may go and find refuge and shelter in your tabernacle up on the holy hill? We're talking about heaven here. And chapter 15, verse 2, 3, and 4, and 5 in Psalms gives you the list. Go down that list and see. Now, it's true. 
You're not saved by works alone, lest any man should boast. You're saved because of the grace of God. We understand that we are New Testament believers, but the Old Testament shouldn't be thrown out. And here's the point, beloved. The devil's trying as hard as he can to go after your name. The value of a good name is a present reality to me. And the reason some tried to take your good name was because the devil was working overtime. We thank God for the daily knowledge of the word of God he's given us in biblical economics. And oh, beloved, the days of losing everything, I want to declare to you they're over. You're no longer going to lose it all. Joseph valued his good name. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing that's more prized than money is a good spouse. Genesis 2.24, they shall be one flesh. I will never forget the spellbinding, riveting story of Alex and his dear precious wife in Michigan how God led him to the airport, made him to sit. God led his wife out of Jamaica, told her where to fly to and sit. And God put them together at the terminal there at the airport. Neither one of them knowing each other, but miraculously they're, they're married, happily married and children. And you look at that and you say, wow, two people listening to the Holy Spirit. It was powerful. I told somebody the other day, in the front seat of my car, and I hope he's watching today. God really loves the institution of the church big time. He created the church. But there's something he loves, an institution, an organized unit that he loves even more than the church. Or he wouldn't have created it before the church. And that's the institution of marriage. It's one of the things that the devil goes after to try to destroy in the world's view, I mean, today, people marrying a dog, they marry a chicken, they marry a chair, they married to their business, married to all kind of stuff, crazy stuff. I never hear the word spouse without thinking of the good wife God has given me. She has proven to be more valuable to me than mere money could ever think of. And I think about Proverbs 31. Somebody said, I, I can't be a Proverbs 31 woman. Did you see that list? Oh, well, that's why verse 10 says, who can find a virtuous woman? Who, who can find her? For her price is far above rubies. So a good name better than riches. A good wife or a good spouse far above rubies. Oh, beloved, I want you to get this in your spirit today. As people come on here and they listen to me talking about seed sowing, they just get a glimpse. They get they see me get excited and they see me talking about the things of God and how all the principles of seed time and harvest, and they think, oh, that, oh he's just a money preacher. No, that's not true. There are, there are things in my life that are off the chart successful that you don't see. I have a success in marriage. I have a success as a father. I have a success in, in a name. And those that chose to believe the negativity and the lies of the enemy about my name, goodbye. It was nice knowing you. I had great times with you, a lot of fun. And sadly, that's going to mean some of your family members. There are going to be family members that are going to listen and believe negativity and the lies of the devil just as quick as anybody else, if not quicker. And it's, it's, it'll tear you apart if you let it. But I love how the scripture tells us the blood of Jesus is going to cover your house. 
A foolish woman will tear her house down with her own bare hands. I love Proverbs 31, 21 it says she is not afraid of the snow for her household for all her household are clothed with scarlet covered by the blood of Jesus. In verse 20, it says she's generous to the poor. Come on, guys, your wife gives to the poor. Don't despise her, celebrate her. You got a good wife. If she's given to the poor, if she's helping people, you've got a Proverbs 31 woman. You've got a rare treasure. Don't get angry. Be happy. Psalms 31 verse 16 says she considers the field and buys it. When I seen that years ago, I realized I will never purchase. And I've seen men do this all the time. They buy things without the advice of their wife and they, and they smart for it later. And I have learned I am not making a major purchase like that without my wife involved. As Proverbs 31, 16 says, she considers the field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. Yeah. So there's a whole study on that, and we could get into the, the study of a good husband in Ephesians 5. But the third thing that's more powerful than money, more, more important than money, is the word of God. A good name, a good wife or good spouse, and the word of God. Some Christians do not value the word enough to invest in it. These books behind me are not for show. There are some, there are some real masterpieces behind me. I've, I've pulled my children aside. I said, look, these are the books. I've got McLaren, McClendon, McLennan's books, a whole set of McLennan from the 1800s. They're so hard to read. They're priceless on the, on the viewpoints of sanctification, on the viewpoints of, of a Pentecostal experience written in London. I told my children, the, these right here, that you won't find them on eBay. <laughs> this one over here, this might be a flimsy little, ma a little, little paperback book. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. You can't buy it less than $100 today. Wisdom. Buy it and sell it not. The word of God. Psalms 119, verse 103. How sweet are thy words. I want the words that come off that page and into my eyes be sweeter to me than the honey in the honeycomb. The sweetness of the word of God. Dictators have tried to flush it out. Tyrants have tried to burn it. Rulers have tried to ban it. Still to this day, your Bible is illegal in I don't know how many nations. If you're caught with it, it could mean they take your head off. Theologians have debated it. Liberals have tried to dilute it. Scoffers have ridiculed it. Even kings like King James paid big bucks to some of the greatest writers of his day, including Shakespeare, to put out what we know now the King James Version 1611. There was a great price to be paid. And we flip it around on a phone. We, we chop it up. We, the word of God, we've got to value more than money. That's a hard thing to think about. That's a hard thing to think about. If I put 10 $100 bills or, or just a $100 bill and take the average young person today and, and, and put the Bible in one hand up like this and put a $100 bill in my hand and ask them, which one, are you, which one would you take? 
I don't even want to think of the consequences on that because you know what a lot of young people would do. They'd snatch that money. You get that Bible in your spirit and in your heart and in your mind and down right down into the depths of your soul and you meditate on it both day and night and you will never weary and everything you do will prosper and your leaf will not wither. That Bible is more valuable than money. Uh, same thing goes for a good wife or a good name. <laughs> They'll take that dollar bill and they look at it as more important. I think our value system is in trouble. Maybe even, maybe even beyond the point of repair in America. Psalms 119 verse 72 the law of God's mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Maybe there's somebody who has gold and silver personally, privately, quietly. Shh. And when we discover what you have, it's 10 ounces. We're talking 10 thousands of pieces of gold and silver. The law of God's mouth is better than that better. He said better unto me. That's what I've got a place. Did I make mistakes? Yes. In, in printing and in, in book writing and not writing soon enough. Yes. Am I struggling trying to just, I've written trying to get it to lay out on the page. Yes. It's a struggle, but I'm fighting my way through every day, inquiring the help of everybody from Siri to Google to all kind of people. But the word of God, getting it on the printed page is still valuable, still powerful today. Converting it from the printed page to a digital page and get it into the eyes and the ears and the mouths of as many people as I can get it to. To, to, to me, that's more valuable than money, more valuable than gold and silver or costly ointment or fragrance or perfume or cologne. It's valuable. Listen, I grew up as a teenager and I put my very life and not just me. I've got a family member who's done the same thing. Put their very life in jeopardy and harm's way, strapping Bibles on the inside of your clothing, putting them in your bags and going through the x-ray scanner conveyor belt at the airport and trying not to breathe heavy and your pulse is going up and you're praying, oh God, I need a miracle. Do not let them open the bag. And then it gets worse. They open the bag. Big old gold cross on the front of the Bibles and it's stacked in there. Nothing but Bibles. And they, they look at it and they smile. Zip, 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 zip. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Chay, -bye. chay, God blinded their eyes. I've seen that. I've seen that. The word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than the two-edged sword, pierced in body, soul, and spirit, joint, and morals, and discern the very thoughts and the intents of a man's heart. The average person in Kenya, Africa, has no Bible of their own. Oh, I know there's some people that can't wait to get malaria shots to everybody on the face of the earth. You know what I want to get? I want to get a Bible to every person's hand. Why? Why? Why, Brother Woods? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to believe God for healing from malaria. The word of God is clear. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if the word of God brings faith and it's impossible to please God without faith, you better get the word. How emphatic are these words? It's impossible to please God without faith. God's word tells us 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing. You got my letter. Did you get my letter? Translators ready, sitting by, wanting to translate our programs into the five most popular languages on the earth. I can take these programs and I can target them with Facebook into some specific countries and win the lost. I'm already making plans because I speak English. I already know working for an evangelist has a television network in, where was it? Scotland, Ireland, London. We flew over and helped teach biblical economics and raised millions and millions of British pounds for his network. And they came to me, they said, ooh, ooh, do you know your most number one responding European country? I said, I don't know. I was shocked when they said it's Holland. I know where to go. I know who will celebrate the gift of God within me. <clears throat> I don't even have to wear wooden shoes. I can sit right here with your help. Talk to London, talk to German, talk to Denmark, talk to Finland, talk to Holland and those that understand English. Scotland, Ireland, they'll pick it up. We can target it through Facebook. What a day we're living in. We're going to have to broaden our, our spiritual eyes. We're going to have to dilate our mind and know that God has not just called us to build another church building. God has called us to get this gospel message out as quickly, as fastly, as, as to as many people as we can. And it takes money. There's something more valuable than money, a good name, a good wife, the word of God. King David, he tells the value of God's word. Psalms 19, 7, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In the living Bible, he says, God's laws are perfect. They protect us, make us wise, give us joy and light. God's laws are pure, eternal, ju eternally just. They are more desirable than gold. They are sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. But they warn us away from harm and give success to those who obey them. A good name, a good wife, the word of God. Number four, understanding. Have you ever tried to communicate things to people and they just did not understand. Wisdom is one thing, but understanding is knowing how to put to use wisdom. Proverbs four and verse seven. When you talk about things that are more valuable than money, you got to include understanding. God's word is very clear about the connection between understanding and being successful in this life. There's a connection. You want to be successful. I heard that Brother Or Roberts, one of the most successful men of the modern time that we live in, in, in the Bible, uh, in these days, excuse me, uh, was known to give an instruction to a worker, a volunteer, a student, and after he gave the instruction, tell them, come here a minute. Repeat to me what I just told you. <laughs> like children. <laughs> you got to do that with your children, right? What What is he doing? Is he trying to be a wise guy? Is he trying to uh, irritate people? Is he? <laughs> no. <laughs> he wants to make sure that they have something more important than money. That's understanding. Did you understand what I said? Did you hear it? Jesus said it. He said, he that hath ears, let him hear. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, not just truly, I say to you. He said, truly, truly. The 
book of Proverbs goes even further and says, those who take the time to get understanding will have riches and honor as well as extend their life. I think some of your lives were extended. I know mine was extended. And I think that a big factor in extending your life here on earth is to get understanding. We see Proverbs 3, 13, 14, and 15, and 16. Happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. Mm -hmm. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. Understanding she is more precious than rubies and all things thou canst desire are not to be compared with understanding. Length of days are in your right hand and in your left hand, riches and honor. Who, who, just the Christian? No, no, no. The, underst the one who has understanding. Do you understand what the Bible is saying? Do you understand what people are telling you? Do you understand what your boss has told you? Do you understand what the preacher says? Do you understand the Bible when you read it? Some people have told me, I do not understand the Bible when I read it. And I've had to pray with them. I've had to break blinders off their eyes. I've had to ask God to illuminate the eyes of their understanding that they could understand what they're reading. I've had to help people to find different translations and and teach them how to read and what to read and when to read so that they could, so they could have an understanding. It's not that you just read it. You got to have an understanding heart. Wisdom and understanding differ. There's a difference between wisdom and understanding. At first glance, verse 13, you know, seems to be saying that both wisdom and understanding are more valuable than gold and silver, but when you examine it even closer, you find that the writer there is placing a greater value on understanding. And when you read it, Proverbs 3, verse 14, let me read it to you. For the merchandise of it, singular, merchandise of it, is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof of fine gold. He states its worth and he speaks in the singular. All right, so this is, this is understanding. I don't know. Maybe you're bored. Are you bored of this? Number five. Something more valuable than money is being the temple of God. Being the temple of God. When I see people, the Bible says when a man sleeps with a man, they damage their own body, Romans 1. The Bible tells us not to mark up our bodies. When I see people damage their own body, it's idolatry. We have to be the temple of God, not just go into the temple of God. Not 2 Corinthians 6, 16, ye are the temple of the living God. Talking about you, talking about me. Jesus carries that on even further. Number six, something more, more important, more invaluable than your money. And this is going to be hard for some of you. The trine of your faith. The Bible mentions no words about the tremendous value of the trine of your faith. If it weren't so clearly stated, it would be so easy to miss the value God pl places on this process. But you hear the apostle as he tells of the infinite prophet that comes to us when God tries our faith. He says these most unpleasant experiences are like the refiner's fire that purifies the finest gold. In 1 Peter 1, 7, he says the trial of your faith in much more precious than gold. First Peter 1, 7, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. Fire, fiery trials. 
Don't blame God for everything. Some of you brought the fiery trials on your own. You didn't need God's help to bring that trial on you. First Peter 4, 12, beloved, think it not strange. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you. Psalms 30, verse five, overcomers. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Romans 5 tells us about being an overcomer. These are things more, more important than money. Number seven, this is big to me. Strategic relationships. If you're my partner, you are a strategic person to be in relationship with me. Not everybody's earned the right to be in relationship with me. Remember that. Some of you are giving access to everybody and you shouldn't. You need to know that access is a gift. The gift of access. Second Kings 5 verse 26 says, is it time to receive money? <laughs> God places high importance on relationships, especially those that have potential to cause a breakthrough. And after you're in ministry for many years, you can attest the value of strategic relationships. How important is that one to worldwide advancement of the kingdom of God? Make no mistake about it, beloved. The devil recognizes the value of those relationships. He does everything in his power to destroy them before they can get off of first base. I think of Elisha and Naaman. There are many strategic relationships in the Bible. But one of those relationships that's strategic begin to develop between an influential Syrian military leader and God's prophet Elijah, Elisha. It could have produced a breakthrough for the union of Israel. And if you look at it in the fifth chapter of the book of second Kings, the high ranking special favor Naaman had with the king of Syria for it was Naaman who led the armies of Syria to victory of the surround over the surrounding nations. And when you look at it really close, you find that the word of God makes a very interesting statement about his heathen military man. Naaman made his mighty conquests with the help of Jehovah God. Second Kings 5.1. Because of him, Naaman, the Lord had given deliverance or victory unto Syria. And while it doesn't state that God's interest in him was specific, it is evident God had plans for Naaman except he never fully realized those plans. And the reason for his failure lies with Elijah's servant, Gehazi. For he had not learned the strategic certain relationship that was more valuable than money. Well, the good news about Naaman is that God had blessed him except the description of Naaman doesn't end on a positive note. The Bible goes on to tell us that Naaman was a leper. In chapter 5, verse 1 of Second Kings. But you go on to read verse 2, and you see more information about God's plan for bringing Naaman into a closer relationship with himself. It says the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captivity out of the land of Israel a little maid and she waited on Naaman's wife. Unknown to his household or to Naaman, her captivity placed one of God's faithful servants inside the house of the captain of the host of the Syrian. And I want you to notice that she did her part. She spoke up exactly at the right time. And this is her message of hope she brought to the house of Naaman. 
She said unto her mistress, chapter 5, verse 3, 2 Kings, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Wow. Just a few words from a little slave girl put world-shaking events into motion. And these events soon place the number two man in all of Syria into the exact strategic relationship with God's prophet, Elisha. And when Naaman arrives at the prophet's house, Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He simply sends him his servant, Gehazi, out to speak to him. And the servant brings the simplest of instructions to that great, powerful world leader and general. And he tells Naaman, go down to the river Jordan and dip seven times. And when Naaman obeys, a wonderful miracle takes place for God instantly heals him of leprosy. Let me read it to you. Verse 14. Then he Naaman down and dipped seven times in Jordan according, by himself, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. But the significance of what happened, God had miraculously healed the captain of the army that holds the nation of Israel captive. The, the next events that take place go beyond the expectation of those just reading the Bible story. Naaman solemnly swears allegiance to Jehovah God. Why? Strategic relationship. Second Kings 5, 15 and 17. Behold now, I know that there is no God in all earth but in Israel. And Naaman said, Thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto Jehovah. The obvious connection. That Naaman is converted to the God of Israel. And when he comes back to that, <laughs> comes back to the prophet's house, Naaman makes a tremendous gesture of gratitude. Here he comes with a big offering, big, big offering, treasure to the prophet of deliverance. Huh? And immediately the prophet realizes the priceless relationship God is setting up between himself and the man who holds the key to the release of Israel from bondage. And what's so spectacular is without hesitation, Elisha refuses the money. But Naaman, this ruler, wants to give him. Instead, he looks to the future and sees the potential blessing that this prominent ruler can be to the kingdom of God. And refusing the money, Elisha deepens the relationship that is rapidly developing between himself and Naaman. Verse 16 says, and the Lord liveth before whom I stand. I will receive none. He, Naaman, urged him to take it, but Elijah refused. And with this refusal, Elisha is saying that a favorable relationship with the most powerful man in Syrian army is much more powerful than the benefit of Naaman's money that could ever bring. You know, greed and ignorance destroy relationships. The greed and ignorance of Elisha's servant Gehazi got in the way and began to break down and bring an end to the strategic relationship that God had, had already established. Running after Naaman under false pretenses, Gehazi takes from him two talents of silver and two garments in a brief moment. The greedy servant ends the beautiful relationship God formed between Elisha, the prophet of God, and the number two man of the nation of Syria. Gehazi hinders the plan of God because he does not understand that certain key relationships are more valuable than money. I want you to hear the prophet's words as they, as he chastens his wicked servant. 
Verse 26, 27, you can read it. Second Kings 5. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants? And mis- He's thinking, what else do they offer him? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the presence a leper as white as snow. Sometimes it's better not to collect an offering, but develop an important relationship. It'll be much more valuable than the money an offering could bring. Jesus knew it. (laughs) How many towns did he get thrown out of? I mean, not just the church. Didn't you just get thrown out of a church? You got thrown out of towns. Oh, are you getting this? Is this good for you? Number eight. Something more valuable, powerful, costly than money is the reproach of Christ. Acts 4, verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's common knowledge that not all Christians feel the reproach of Christ. While no one wants to admit it, there is a way of living that avoids the persecution that comes with a bold Christian witness. There are many secret disciples running around. Even during Jesus' early life, it is common for people to avoid the reproach of Christ. The Bible tells of a prominent Jewish leader who respected and loved the Lord, except rather than face reproach from the Jews, he chose not to identify publicly with Jesus. John 19, 38 tells the story, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, was an admirer of Jesus. Except even this well-known Bible character chose the cover of night to visit the Lord. Beloved, there's some things in life that are more costly, more priceless, more valuable, more important than money. Number nine, worshiping the true and living God. Do you worship the Lord? I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about, I'm talking about in the daytime. You worship him. What does it mean to worship him? It means to adore him enough to spend time with him, to, to be in his presence, to, to just love on him and tell him how great he is and bragging on him. Worship. got to worship the Lord. Worshiping the Lord. No money can buy that. It's worth more than money. Worshiping God is to me worth more than silver, gold, rubies, diamonds, houses, cars, anything luxurious the world has to offer. That's it. Worshiping God is so valuable to me. I love ministers who minister to the Lord. When they minister to the Lord, it ministers to me. In the presence of Jehovah. God Almighty. Come 
on, tell him he's almighty. Prince of Peace. Troubles vanish. Hearts are mended. Oh, yes, Lord. In the presence, I love to be in the presence of the King, of the King. Jason, I hear the Lord say for you tonight, the best is yet to come. Jason, are you watching? The best is yet to come. The worst is over and the best is just, God is for you and he's fighting the battle for you. He loves you, Jason. Right there where you are, somebody just lift your hands up and love the Lord. Come on, lift your hands up and love him. I love you today, Lord. I love you every day. God, I ask you to heal the ripped open wounds of my brother or my sister. Heal the wounds, the internal bleeding. Heal him now. In the presence of Jehovah, God, God Almighty. Come on, I know it's an old song, but. The only ones that YouTube allows me to sing. Prince of Peace, sing it with me. Troubles vanished. Hearts are mended. Troubles vanished. Oh, yeah. Hearts are mended. Of the King, of the King. Now, Jesus, we come to you, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I pray right now for my brother. I pray right now for my sister. Troubled in their heart, going through things that they never thought they would go through. Feeling in the middle of the night that they're by themselves, that they're alone. But I say boldly and emphatically under the prophetic anointing of the Holy Ghost, you are not alone. For if God be with you, who dare be against you? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. Thank you, Jesus. Take my tongue. Use my tongue, Holy Spirit. Use my tongue, Jesus. Somebody wrestling with a kidney problem. The Lord's healing your kidneys. Right now, throw your hands up and begin to worship God. Begin to praise the Lord for healing down into your kidneys. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. In the presence of Jehovah, ah, yeah, Lord, God Almighty. of peace troubles they vanish right now 
Infirmity has to vanish, has to go. Hearts are mended. Right now, I speak to that high blood pressure. I speak to that irregular heartbeat. I command it to fall in line with the Word of God. I command that enlarged heart to be made normal. I command heart failure to leave. In the name of Jesus, I speak peace and healing right now to your heart. Do it now, Lord. We believe that they receive it, O oh God. May we always value the Word of God more than gold and silver. May we have priorities where we prioritize the gospel. Let our strategic relationships, golden connections from the Father, be more valuable than things. Materialism, and I tell my children this, is putting things before people. Christianity is putting people before things. Very simple. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody ought to give God the praise and give him the thanks right now. I love him, don't you? Come on, get up and stretch a little bit. I've been spoon feeding the word of God to you. I love the Lord. Been so good to me. I love the Lord. Been so good to me. I love the Lord been so good to me I love his holy name I love the Lord been so good to me I love the Lord been so good to me I love his word it's been so good to me I love his holy name God, you're a good God. Can you just shout it out and tell the Lord how good he is to you? Can you just take a moment and tell him how much you love him? I guess we could say that in this message, things that are important, more important than money not the end of it actually I've just taken a little break here Holy Ghost break we see that the scripture says money answers all things there's some values and virtues that are more important than than things and we must know that we know those things let me take a moment here let me take a break we're believing God for 1,000 people to sow $1,000 towards our towards our special date to push the shovel in the ground and declare a certain portion of property as the Lord's, a ministry center. If you have that on your bank card and you can do it, go to money, monthlypartners.com, monthlypartners.com, sow that $1,000, let this number come down tonight. We've gone from a thousand to nine hundred and ninety-four. Nine hundred and ninety-four. We're almost there. Nine hundred and ninety-four more to go. Well, if four people do that tonight, we'll have only nine hundred. Somebody, it was prophesied to me and told to me today that somebody would could give $10,000 and it would knock it even down more. We'll take 10 off the, we'll take 10 right off the scoreboard there. Our goal board. That's the best way to do it. Go to monthlypartners.com and so if you don't have $1,000, but you can sew 100 or 20 or 15 or five, whatever it might be. If you want to go to our property goal, market our property goal. 
we're going to get this done and you're going to help us. Praise the Lord for it. Lots of other people have started out helping us. And I believe God has been an answer. It is an answer to our prayer that you've tuned in tonight. Go right now to monthlypartners.com while I take a break here. We're going to get back in the word. Good to see Jim and Joanne from Kentucky. Good to have Tammy and Ron from Iowa. Stacy from Texas. God bless you, Stacy. Jason. Good to see you, Jason. Your picture on here. Sheila from Southern Oregon. Randy, God bless you, Randy. Ah, yeah. Faith and Alex from Michigan. Got your message today. Karen and Ron from Portland, you got my letter today. Who else got my letter? Who else got my letter? Put it on there and just say, I got your letter today. If you haven't got the letter, perhaps it's still on the way, or perhaps you're you're not you're not part of my airmail team. This is offering time, just like in church. Many of you have told me you never think of coming to church empty-handed. Well, this is just like that time. If you want to sow using the mail, that'd be fine. David Woods Ministries. Post Office Box 90911, Portland, Oregon. 97290. That's David Woods Ministries. Post Office Box 90911. Portland, Oregon, 97290. Sit down and write me today. Let me know that you're enjoying the program. Nothing like camp meet and sound, let me tell you. I love to be in camp meet and sound when the anointing is flowing and God is moving. And some of you haven't been under a gospel tent in years and we got our gospel tent. Sometimes we set it up in certain places. Never forget the Lord told me to break it down in Kentucky and go to Detroit. I said, Lord, I don't know anybody in Detroit. He said, you know me and that's all you need to know. I said, who do I ask permission? He said, don't ask permission, just set it up. I did it. Those little saints come out of that tent. One little precious mother, she got up and testified, said, in a span of 30 days, we've had everything come under this tent. Winos, hookers, prostitutes, pimps, drug addicts, drug dealers. We got saved, delivered, set free. That's what I love more than anything. More than anything. I'm waiting for you to get up today and go to monthlypartners.com, sow your seed and invest in a ministry. Did you get something out of that? I know you did. You received from the word of God today. It's worth sowing into. I said it's worth sowing into. minutes to the top of the hour we'll mark it down as being with you for two hours is it unreasonable to be with you that many hours a night YouTube informed me they said that you're in the one percentile of all the broadcasters that go that long kind of easy to do when I've got great partners who love me, love this program, love the anointing on my life. 
kind of easy to do when you got the Hammond B3 swinging and the Holy Ghost falling. Where's my hanky? I feel I'm bubbling over. <laughs> I feel the Lord bubbling. He's a bubbling and a bubbling and a bubbling. Jesus, I thank you. No weariness. No mental discouragement or defeat upon my brother and upon my sister. I command every demon to get back. To get back away from my brother. Get back away from my sister. You will not harass them. No way. No way. No harassment. In the name that is above every other name. In the name of Jesus. Father, let the release of the Spirit of God come upon. There it comes. There it comes. There it comes. There it comes. Right now, upon the viewer, upon the listener. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> there are probably a thousand better singers than me, but I just love to praise the Lord, don't you? Come on, praise him, somebody. Give the Lord the highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and give the Lord the highest praise. Hallelujah. Listen. I want to say this, that let me not diminish the value or the importance of your seed. Yes, there are other things that are more important. And I think it's very important that we realize that, but we must never diminish the value of a seed. We must realize that those things that we have can be sown. Let me tell you a little example. When people look on and see I have a godly wife full of character and integrity, that is sown into their mind, it's sown into their into their thinking. When they hear about a, a good name that's sown into other ministers looking on thinking, I want to be like that. Even that is a seed. I, I just about look at everything like a seed. Your smile is a seed. Your taxes that you pay is a seed into good government. That's right. Just so you know, we got some affiliates maybe leaving here pretty soon. So you know, I'm coming to, I'm coming to the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I believe it's going to be 30 days of a Holy Ghost gully washer. I believe it. Probably the whole month of July. I tried to go when it was cooler, but this is the way the Lord worked it out. We don't follow the weather either. Don't look at the clouds to determine your harvest. And then we'll come back up through Atlanta possibly and spend some time with my good friends in Atlanta and then back up hopefully to North Carolina, Charlotte. Got some of you listening on Charlotte, 93.3 FM. And uh, where do we go from there? Washington, D.C., perhaps? Nope, nope. Uh, Kentucky. We'll head on to Kentucky. We'll be in, um, I'm sure we'll be in uh, down by Elizabethtown. Litchfield. That's central Kentucky, right? Western central Kentucky. Then we'll come up. Lord willing, I'm going to be with my brother Mike and Dee. That's the highlight of the whole trip right there. Just being around those folks. Full of joy, full of freedom. And my wife and children, too. Well, just being in Henderson, Kentucky is a thrill enough. And then you get the cherry on top, which is that whole family, you know. And um, I think from there we go to, well, we're going to stop off and see Jim and Joanne. Lexington. I want to see my partners along the way, you know. 
my friends and partners. Maybe I should get a bus where I can pack everybody up. I wonder if Jim would cooperate if I stuffed him in a suitcase and took him with me. But we can't take Jim by himself. We got to take Jim and Joanne. We got a big, got to get a big. S- <laughs> Jim, Joanne, I need a big suitcase so I can stuff you and take you with us. Lord knows they want to go. And then from there, we'll go on to, um, I wish I could come up to Michigan. We won't have time. I think we'll go to Minneapolis, Iowa, then Minneapolis. Some of you folks in Iowa may have to come down and visit us in, I don't know, Des Moines or somewhere along the path there in Iowa. It's just a summer tour. You know, it's just a, we're in and out, just very short, short time, just two months. We're going to make good use of all the time. From Iowa, we'll run up to Minneapolis. From Minneapolis, I'm going to pray over the city. Go from Minneapolis over to Montana. And I'll be nice to be in Montana the month of when? August? September? And back home, first week in September, second week of September, I'll be back here in the studio. But while I'm on the road, I'm going to try my very best to come to you every night and broadcast to you Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, simulcast from my device, perhaps in my car, perhaps in a back booth of a restaurant, perhaps in a hotel lobby. It could be anywhere, folks. It could really be anywhere. Kind of makes me nervous a little bit, but because I like to do things in excellence, but I mean, I got the best iPhone you can get, so that won't be a problem, but it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I think I can read off the phone and pray with you. and I'll come home for September and October and then run down to Arizona in November. Be down in Arizona just for a few weeks in November. And come back. Were you able to get your offering in? That's what I've been just kind of waiting for. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for $10 offering. Thank you, Lord, for those who give, not only out of their need, but give because it's a seed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, Joanne, I see that. That's powerful. I'm, I never, never forget that. Glory. Now, Father, I lift up all those that have sown into good ground. Bless them, Father. Multiply their seeds sown. Increase it, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let your hand come down upon all that they have and all that belongs to them. And I thank you, Father, for on this church night, on this church night, Lord, many people are not with us. They're in church. They're in their own home church. On this church night, Lord, bless my brother, bless my sister, and let the fragrance of the Holy Spirit fall upon them wherever they may be, no matter where they are. Let your healing oil flow over them tonight. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Listen, beloved. There are some pretty important things in life. Tend to them. Go back over it. Look at it. Play it again. Play it again. Let it be a blessing to you. I'm out of time. Listen, I want you to sit down and write me. David Woods Ministries, Post Office Box 90911. Portland, Oregon, 97290. That's David Woods Ministries, Post Office Box 90911, Portland, Oregon, 97290. Sit down and write me. Let me know your most urgent prayer need, and I want to pray over you as I get your letter. I'll be with you on here tomorrow night, Friday night. 
Let's see what God will do the rest of this week. Amen. You've been listening to Pray America Live with evangelist and radio pastor David Woods. Join us online with David Woods Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope channels for a refreshing time of one-on-one prayer, testimonies, and singing. David Woods Ministries is supported by the love gifts and free will love offerings of partners just like you. You can become a radio ministry partner by going to www.monthlypartners.com.